Today's topic is going to be the um, um, Azure RAF. Um, again, Azure RAF is not something new. It is there for more than a ticket, but we're going to see in a different glass of how you can use the RAF. Before I dive into a topic, a little bit about me. My full name is Uday Paramachandran. I shortly go by Uday. Um, I lead as a CTO, CSO, and Akimla Inc. And we build an employee experience platform that, that runs in Azure Cloud and uses the M365 suite to integration. Uh, I'm an Azure MVP for the last three years. Um, I'm playing the space Azure, AWS, and Google a lot. Um, but mostly my Azure um, play, build a SaaS platform in AWS and a little bit on it. I run this user group. That's why you are here. And that's my personal uh, site. I just just my community profile site. So today's agenda, we're going to talk about the Azure overview and how it works and deployment scenario and the benefits and how you can query the logs, you know, um, and then some of the demo uh, we'll walk through. The main highlight is the tar production. I'm going to talk about it and most of the stuff you might have seen it, you might have heard it, you might have used it, but what I'm going to show is the different, which is not in the in the WAF uh, fully integrated, but I'll show you a little bit how we solve this problem. So what is um, Azure WAF, right? So as the definition says, is a web application firewall. Um, it's a cloud-based web application firewall. Um, so the, the key advantage or key features of the web application firewall is, you know, Azure WAF is it provides you a two modes. One is a prevention and detection. Detection mode is kind of, um, you know, it logs the uh, malicious request, but it still let you go through it. Right, so you want to do some analysis how the behavior of your website works, how the malicious actor come into the system. You want to learn about all those things. You don't have to prevent it. You can detect it. Right, how the payload comes. So you can when you go from detection to prevention, you are not breaking the site. Uh, some context you know, when we went from detection to prevention without you know the full analysis, we were end up breaking some URLs and we need to exempt it. So you can learn a lot about the uh, malicious request or actor, whatever you call it as. I mean, some are known, some are unknown, even the system that you built your own. It's a comprehensive production, it, it's you know, it's a top OWSP. Um, um, top 10, uh, including the SQL injection production, cross-site uh, prevention, and then TDOS mitigations. Those are the top three SQL injection, right? You know, in the old days, you know, somebody can send a text which is delete from star. If you don't sanitize the input string and it's going to run in the SQL and it's going to delete the users and so on. That's a SQL injection. Cross-site cross scripting is you, you go from one site to other site and you, know, you, you, you exploit the request with the JavaScript uh, and so on. TDO, uh, TDOS mitigation is, you know, users can hammer your site for no reason. They want to bring it down. Their intention is to bring it down. They can hammer your site, right? Coming from the malicious IP address, which we're going to show you. I, I'm going to show you um, how the malicious user come into anonymous IP address, you know, being anonymity, how they will hammer our site. It also comes with a pre-configured policy, so you don't have to worry about it. It has all the policies. If the policy doesn't solve the problem, then you're going to go to the custom rules, right? So you're going to create your own rules when the default policy is not meeting your criteria. Sometimes, you know, you are not able to fix the critical problem, but you want to exempt it, you know the risk of it, then you will use the custom rules uh, to exempt those things. Uh, integration with other services, seamless integration with the front door, web application gateway, and CDN. In the Azure, those are the three services. Front door is the global firewall, uh, global load balancer. Application gateway is the local load balancer. And we will see in a diagram how this works. And, and, and then the last but not least, the real time monitoring and analytics. It provides a full insight of your traffic, how it comes, you know, what is what, what the request is carrying, or what the rule it hit, and it will it will give the full history of the request. We'll learn a lot when you're going through it. So you need to turn on the diagnostic in order to see the uh, monitoring and uh, analytics. So here is uh, some a uh, high level example of how it works. Uh, if you take the, the right side diagram, there is a top and bottom. There's two diagrams, right? The top diagram, I call it as the uh, global load balancer. It's the global load balancer runs everywhere. Um, you know, you run a WAF in a in a front door, right? So you you so you have a server in the eastern Germany, US and Germany, for example, two regions, US Eastern Germany, but your request coming from say Australia, most likely they're going to land in a US region, right? Uh, but so 
this case, we are not running the local VAP. So front door now pass the request to the VAP. VAP tells you this is the malicious record or malicious actor, then immediately it rejects that, right? If you are in a prevention mode, if you are in a detection mode, it locks that, okay, there is a malicious request coming in and then it'll let you go to the site. But this is for, you know, you only adopt this scenario. If you need a low latency and high performance, and this is the best scenario. You use the global VAF and then, you know, you have a front door, it runs on the edge, servers everywhere, and then it uses the WAF detection right in there, and then it redirects to the site only if the, the requests are valid. The bottom one, you call it as the local WAF, which runs part of the application gateway. So you have region one and region two, say for example, US Eastern Germany, right? And you have to put an app gateway in Germany, app gateway in um, US East, like region two, and then you have to put, you, you need to apply the WAF for the app gateway for the region one, app gateway, WAF for the region two, right? So you need to apply that. And then you can use the load balancer like a traffic manager. Um, you can even use the front door, but the second diagram, you, you know, you can still use the second diagram front door. You can route to that way. Um, you can have a, you know, the, the origins pointing to, um, uh, application gateway IP is right. You can still have it, but the main concept is when you apply the application gateway, it is called local WAF. So in the regional WAF, in other words, okay, that's how it works. So deployment scenario. So we saw that application gateway WAF for single region deployment, front door WAF for global multi-region applications with the low latency needs and CDN integration protects the uh, static content delivery. I mean, front door also uh, CDN support, you know, uh, if there is a static content, it will hash it on the edge uh, for the better performance. Uh, what's the key uh, key benefits of using Azure? Customizable rules. The default rules is not enough. Then you're going to um, you're going to use the um, um, customizable rules. Um, it has the inbuilt threat intelligence feeds. Um, the some thing that we're going to talk about, ta 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 you know, in a few minutes. Um, you know. They have a threat intelligence feeds. They know what is the right IP, wrong IP, you know, uh, what, what type of request is malicious or not. They're constantly getting the feed and, and uh, uh, you know, they will update the rules accordingly. <clears throat> uh, next thing is the uh, uh, control and flexibility. Uh, so you have a full way to control these things. <clears throat> And the WAF configuration level. Give one second, I have something. So, for example, you know, um, uh, IPs, behavior pattern, allowing fine tune your security measures, those are helps you to the control and the flexibilities. Um, integration with the Sentinels, and you can forward the entire log to a Sentinel, let the Sentinel analyze your log and, and do, um, um, yeah, you know, threat detection in that way, right? So, um, you can set up alert blocks of PSIPs and analyze incidents in a real time, ensuring deep security uh, management and so on. Uh, product, production against evolving attack techniques, right? The Azure app is continuously updated to counter new threats. Um, so that's a cool thing, right? So they are always going to update the spec and update the fixes and they are now available to um, the applications. So attack, uh, attackers adapt, you know, Azure apps rule sets to improve, ensuring that you stay protected against emerging threats. Um, it's scalable and cost effective. So it's pay as you go model. So you don't have to invest anything. You know, if you have a small, medium, large, you know, you can expand. You know, it's a pay as you go model that helps you to adopt in, you know, zero to whatever you can expand your application to. Um, automation and the regular updates, you know, as the um, as the policy, you know, as the um, the ground increases the attack and the policies are refined and deployed. I mean, you can also automate some of your custom rules. So if you have some custom rules you want to constantly update, for example, you know, tar IPs change every four hours, eight hours, right? They are not going to be constant because they are be continuously changing IPs. So you want to bring the new set of IPs, configure it, you can automate that part. Um, so it's continuously update those IP lists so you stay um, security focused. All right, so let's go to the next one. The next one, so in this, 
topic, you know, I'm going to walk you through everything. The one thing that I'm going to highlight is the uh, um, TAR uh, network, right? So why I picked it up, this is something that the new that I'm going to show you, which is not there. Um, so TAR is nothing but the onion router. It's decentralized network designed to enhance the privacy, right? So once a user comes from the TAR network, it is anonymity. So you do not know where they're coming from. It can be a public app, it can be a you know internal app, or it can be a multi you know algorithm based app. But they can hide their location. It helps them to privacy. It can help them to bypass the sensor and get into the site, right? So that's a network. You know, it's a le legitimate network. It's not a, um, a blocked network or something. It's a legitimate. If a user need to avoid a sensority, then they can go through this um network to hide themselves it gives them a high privacy so when you are coming from us you know you go through multiple nodes doing you know every node does its own encryption so it's hard to trace where you're coming from um next so i mean you know the, since it's anonymity people can misuse tar tar is is, is meant for a good you no know, there are good actor and bad actor right if you're a good actor you fine you just want to hide your identity where you're coming from but you are not a malicious actor then it's fine but if you're a bad actor then it's a it's a dangerous thing so they can do a um, tds attack right so how they can do a tds attacks since the ip's addresses are hidden um, they can come and simulate the request from you know one IP to other IP to other IP. There are you know um, TAR releases the exiting IPs uh, about uh, 15, uh, 12, 1300 um, IPv4 blocks and 800 IPv6 block. They can constantly move those IPv6 blocks. They can try to generate the traffic to your site to bring your site down. Well, you can find it out. You can say, okay, I'm going to block this IP address. But since it's a, it, you know, it's a dynamic nature, they will go back to the other IP address. They'll go back to the third IP address. They'll go back to the fourth IP address. So that's how they generate the traffic, right? The, the tedious attack happens. Um, uh, scraping and brute force attacks, right? Um, so, so these. If you create a virtual machine, if you lead on the internet, uh, you know, if you open the uh, RDP port open, you see, you know, you create in the morning, you see in the afternoon, you are guaranteed to get at least max two digit of brute force attacks to happen because people are trying to attack you. Well, do you think they're going to attack from the legitimate network? Definitely not. They're going to use network like a tar to, to do that type of attack so you cannot trace back who is doing that. It's also a, you know, um, dark web and illicit markets for you know illegal activities, uh, identity theft. They can happen when the people come from those IPs. They can do all these kind of things. So data exfiltration uh, is a one way that you can misuse, meaning that you know you can copy the data knowing the, without knowing where you're copying, who is cop copying. You can be the hidden user, and you can copy the data. Uh, from the exfiltration. That's why some companies, they will block all the TAR network, you know, so some financial companies, they'll block the TAR networks. Some mine companies, they'll block the TAR networks because they want it to be their user to be legitimate. They are not coming from these hidden networks. Even though they prompted for MFA and other, other things, but they still wanted the user to be coming from the known location. The phishing and malware distribution, they can run some site by using these IPs. They, they, you know, they lure you, you know, by taking your information and so on. Uh, that's, those are the misuse scenario of the um, uh, TAR IPs. Uh, risk of allowing the TAR traffic, um, as we've seen before, uh, is increased attack surface. Uh, users can easily mask their IP address, making it easily for them to probe your infrastructure, right? So, you know, for, you know, they're looking for vulnerabilities. Since they're coming from the hidden network, they can constantly see, uh, you know, uh, go through your site and then find if there is any vulnerability, they can, they can have, you know, get hold of it, right? Um, difficult in the monitoring and enforcement. Um, traditionally, security controls such as an IP blocking or geofencing, right? So you can do a geofencing. But the TAR IP is also coming from the geo. It's going to pass the geofencing. If you look at the location, it may say, you know, I'm coming from you know, XYZ location. It's not anonymous location. It's a known location. But the tracing back where it's originated is very hard. Um, this limits your ability to enforce location-based roles. So you try to set the location-based roles, and also known as geofencing. But you, you, this is this is going to succeed because this is coming from the known locations. Um, negative impact on the business. If you have a, you know, uh, if you if you have brand uh, brand name is popular and things like this may 
bring a negative um, impact to your branding as people trying to um, do some sort of exfiltration or you know potentially some sort of legal issue. So, so uh, most com financial companies are sensitive based on your sensitive data, they will block the down IPs. Next slide. So how you can set up the uh, TAR network, how you can test, right? So in order to test the TAR network, all you need is the TAR browser. So it's very simple, um, just to go to this project, download, you got the TAR browser, you can use your laptop, it's very safe. Uh, unless you use that one, uh, you don't need to use the TAR browser, but for testing purpose, you can install just a EXE. Uh, open the browser and then configure. You, you always go through a TAR um, uh, nodes and then you're good to go. You just put the IP address, it's going to go through the TAR networks. Fine. Now you've gone through all the rules, you know, bypass and prevention detection. We're going to see the demo, but once you see it, you know, how do you know if the block happened, right? So your request is blocked, but you want to know what is blocking, or your request is granted, detected, and then uh, you know passed to the server. But you still want to learn what are all the malicious activities is going on. So these are the things you do, right? So you go and run a query, um, you know, as a diagnostic. So one prerequisites, you must turn on the diagnostic first, then you can run the queries to see which roles are effective, which roles are bypassing, why it's bypassing, what is the, uh, you know, what parameter is bypassing, what is the, uh, um, you know, um, score it's contributed. So you will get a full details about the request, right? And then you can go and either, either again, exempt it or you fix the code to, um, you know, do the right thing or you exempt it. <clears throat> All right, so let me go and walk you through the portals here. So I'm, I have a resource group, then I created a front door, as I said, uh, front door is the global WAF. Uh, we're going to use it. And then I have two websites, um, um, app WAF demo and app demo API, right? This is just an API, simple API call. And then here's the website I have it. I, I have it because I can walk you through a few things over here. Then uh, we have the firewall policy. So if you look at this policy, uh, you know, in the policy settings, uh, the overview, we have switched to a prevention mode. Right now it runs in a detection mode. What does that mean? It's not going to block anything, but it's going to write what is going on with that, okay? Um, in order to put detection mode, you need to switch that to a detection mode, okay? So I'm going to switch to detection mode. It's going to take some time. So we'll keep it that way. And then you open a new tab and explore from. As I said before, prevention mode, even the malicious request is going to go through, but it's going to log on the system. You can look at the log. Uh, now policy settings, um, you have a way to redirect. If, if, if any of those um, things are met, it's only going to happen on a detection mode, okay? So it's not, these things will execute only on a, sorry, prevention mode. Detection mode, it detects, it locks, it goes to our app. Prevention mode, it detects, it stops there. At that time, it's going to come back and execute this page, right? Whatever you you, you define it over here. Either you can redirect it to some page or you can redirect, um, you know, some sort of block response. Um, the default block response is 403, which makes sense. But sometimes, you know, we also have access denied based on the login failed or some sort of permission issue. So to differentiate, some people would recommend file 11. Unfortunately, file 11, they are not giving here. Okay, Those are the valid numbers. So you can pick any of those numbers. Um, it makes sense to pick a random number, 99, not a random number, the number they allow it. So if you look at it, they allow that number. But file 9, 511 makes sense is a network not granted or something. 549 or 59 says a legal reason which is not available. Those are the two two flag I would lean towards. But since those two is not available, then I'm I'm picking 999. Then you can say what is the response body. So if you make everything is empty, it would still give you the reference ID. But if you want to make it as you know a uh, little informative, you can do that. They only allow you only one token called Azure Ref. That is the only token available from here, but that token is what gives you um, the token to query the logs, right? So if some request is blocked or you want to learn something or somebody gives you the number, then you go, that's the Azure ref is what they're passing it to you. You can take that Azure ref and then run the query in the backend system to do that. What is blocked? This JavaScript challenge is, is a different concept. You know, if you go to some sites, they will ask you, um, you know, to verify you are a human, right? Uh, that's the JavaScript challenge. You know how often you want to do it, but in order to do that, you need to set up the policy in the backend. 
but that's what it is. So you, how often you want to um, check whether you are a human, right? So kind of things. <laughs> All right, that's the policy settings. The main thing is when the block is prevented, when the request is prevented, this gets executed and then it's going to return 999 and whatever it is. Now we come back to the managed rules. Remember we said uh, WAF is providing a out of the box policies, right? So these are the policies. If you use a, a front door premium WAF, it gives you the bot protections. This is this will be available only for premium. If you use standard, these things won't be available. So if you are internet applications, you already get default things, right? So you can go ahead, you know, and then you can disable it or block it, right? You know, you don't need a search engine to come back to an internet application because most of the requests need the authentication to be done first, right? So you can block it, uh, those two. And then if you look at this here, uh, bot 300, 600 is what kind of test the tar production, which gets a threat intelligence and then trying to protect it. But when I try to use it, you can bypass through that uh, by, by checking these and then marking this as a block, it, it does prevents the IPv4 range, but not IPv6 range, okay? so. That's what we're going to see how we can do some custom rules. It does prevent the IPv4 though. Um, and then, you know, you can go through it, some of the excesses, uh, SQL injection and so on. There's a lot more policies come under the category, which I, which is all defined over here. And then you will available, this link is available end of the presentation. So you can go through how all those numbers are tacking together, okay? So next is a, uh, the, the managed rules. Once you enable, as I said before, it's it, these are all very important when you do a prevent, not detection. Detection is going to go through, you will learn it from the log. It's not going to stop anything, but these are all going to be applied. This, which rule is failing, you know, why it's failing, it's mainly important when you are today, when you are preventing it. That's why in the testing phase, you're always going to leave it at the detection mode. Then you learn it, you tweak it, and then you go to the prevention mode instead of directly going to the prevention mode. You never know, you know what request is you know acting there. Um, in this, uh, you know, oftentimes you may come into a picture of exclusion, right? It's not possible to fix everything. Uh, to run a site in a 100% security, right? Just like you know, your computer is vulnerable. Yes, it is vulnerable. When it's not vulnerable, when you turn off the computer, right? Well, you are not going to turn off the computer. You're going to leave your computer in the internet space. But you still need to take precautions, uh, you know, to uh, stay safe from the internet um, uh, malicious attacks, right? Likewise, you know, not you, you, your, your code is not going to be perfect. You know, you always, you know, you have to post a request from one side to other side. That's called RFI. You know, there is some rules here. So if you look at the RFI, you know, if you look at, if you want a particular rule, off domain reference link, you know, you have one domain, but now you go back to the other domain, either you post it, which is a known domain, it's going to say off domain, you know, it's going to prevent it. You know, you cannot post because this is coming from a different domain. But in reality, you need that to be done. So that's why you're going to exempt to that, right? So something like it. So you can pick the policies and exempt it, or you can say all policies. So but now the way that this configured right now, I, I'm 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 skipping all policy, all policies, right? Otherwise, if I only see that problem of off reference, the, the the log will tell you 931130 is failing. Then you can come back and then you know just configure that particular only alone. Then you can say. Where, where are all you going to exempt it? You're going to exempt it in a header name and you can say start with, end with, equals, contains, or equal any means, you know, it can be anything. You know, I, I don't have time to find out what is coming in because this system is built for last 10 years. I don't have all the parameters. Then you can pick equals any. If you know the parameter, what do you want to allow, then you're going to say what contains or equals, you know, whatever it is, right? Similarly, you go through the other requests, cookie name, um, query string. Um, body post arguments like you know when when the data comes as a you know a form body what it's going to be and then the json arguments body comes as json what it's going to be equal any is the safest but i wouldn't recommend equal any all the time but you still have to go through your system you know better better about your system if you know the known parameter that's what you're going to say contains you know keep adding it or you can say request data name equals you know you can say you know x and then you can say request data name equals you know, you can say why, you know, these are those are the headers. You can keep add things like this as well, right? All right, that's that's how you 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 um, exclude um, uh, exclude on the managed rules. So, so you can see there is a you know a lot of sets over here, um, which is a protocol enforcement method enforcement. You know, sometimes you think it's all the records are get post and put. Sometimes there may be a delete request coming in. Sometimes maybe a head request is coming in. So then you need to adjust over here. 
or you can just over the code. Uh, but this is to safeguard before you hit your code, right? In SQLI, XSS, RFI, we looked at it. And similarly, LFI, uh, protocol attacks, um, you know, and then the the new thing will happen based on the query string or data, SQL injection, you know. Um, I gone through all these, uh, you know, different things in, in, in our application, but we, this is how you're going to look at it. But I'm going to show you how you can see what is causing the trouble. Then you you come back and add the managed tools. All right. Now let's go back here. Um, now coming back to the custom rules, right? Look, if the managed rule is not enough or it's not satisfying your need, then you come back to the custom rules. So in the custom rules, you define the rule, and if you already have a rule, you can disable it. Uh, you know, if there is something, if there is a problem, then you can instantly disable it. Uh, like if I want to edit this role, for example, I know uh, I know that that is not correct. You know, I don't want to remove it because it takes time to do it. Then I can disable it. Okay, so you do a new role and give the name. The rule type can be a match pattern or the rate limit. Rate limit is is kind of you know this is what I was telling you, right? Tar, you know, you you see that some IP is coming um, frequently. They're causing a problem, right? You go and block the IP address. But they can come from the another IP address. Now you go and block the IP address. They can come from the another IP address, right? And then they can come from the IPv6. Then they can come from the IPv4. So they can cause you a lot more trouble. That, you know, but there is a type, match or rate limit. That's what rate limit means. And then you can set the priority. So it executes based on the priority number. And the match type can be geolocation, which is can be a remote address, uh, right? And then you can tell what regions. Um, so. Most people, what they will do, I don't want anybody to come from the unknown region, right? So you you want to know that every IP address attached to the location. If that comes as unknown, uh, you know, no location discovered, then then technically it's a malicious request coming in. So you can do that, you know, I'm going to call this as the, uh, um, you know, uh, unknown location, right? Something like that, unknown location. Then you can say remote address is unknown, then deny the traffic, okay? Um, so what is the other one? And then the IP address, right? So you can do a remote IP address. That's the scenario I was telling you, the malicious actor coming from the multiple different IP address, then you can do that. But if you look at over here, this sub, uh, supports 600 IP address. So we programmatically added 600, 600 balance, uh, 600 balance. Okay, I'll show you where we did all those things. Um, IP address, you can block or allow, right? So based on your, your requirement, either you can block or allow. Uh, third match pattern is the size. Um, you can do what, you know, the query string tries, a request URI, request getter, post org, request party, cookie. So you you have a way to control by using the size. You know your application that, you know, your size is going to be, say, 20 KB, uh, 20, you know, 200 bytes, not kilobytes. So bytes of payload is going to come in, then you can restrict that. Anything comes to more is a suspect request. Somebody does not know the system, they're trying to maliciously attack your system, then you can configure that. And then the string, uh, string you can do these again those parameters. You know, request URI. This is the easy to filter things. You know, you want to allow certain certain query string, or you want to allow certain URI. You don't know why it's not working, but you want to allow certain URI. Yeah, then you can say contains and then thing. This can go up to ten values, uh, and then you can say instead of deny allow, right? Uh, uh, so once you fit the value, allow traffic. Okay. Or JS challenge. If that route comes in, I want to put a JS challenge, which is preview here, but that will say ask you, are you a human? Right? It 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 prompt you in a way and then ask you, are you a human? You might have seen a lot of sites and mainly um the one site that I always yeah, bank sites. If you go to uh, you know, some of the bank sites, they'll ask you, or uh, you can see the cloud flyer verification going on. That's a cloud cloud flyer WAF is doing the job. Um okay, so that's all about. And uh, now let's go back and then show you. So is this the only way you can do a tar prevention, right? It's not really, but you know, since this needs to, the IP address constantly changing, right? You see the IP address now, there may be, uh, you know, plus or minus 10 can happen end of the day, right? And then tomorrow morning, there may be another plus or minus 10 can happen, or plus or minus 20, or plus or minus 30, because this is a dynamically IP address. But how do you know what IP address is changing? The one way you can solve this problem is sort of, you know, here we we you know we need to run some scheduler. That's what I call it as automation. You know, you constantly fetch the latest IP from the exiting IPs list and then update it over here. Or 
you can do it programmatically in your application right so you know you are you can write a code that invokes the modular module handler and then you can do it for example so if i go back to uh, this program over here right uh, which, which I wouldn't prefer it, but I have it as a different way of doing things, right? So I have that, you know, tar production middleware, okay? So if we go back to the tar production middleware, right? So we have is IPR load, you know? So when you go to that method, all we do here, uh, we say IPv6, con you know, contains IP address or IPv4 contains that IP address, then return IP load is false, uh, true, right? So if you look at this code over here, all we do, it change the percentage to be a little less, maybe 150. Uh, all we do here, we go through this. This is the publicly published IP address, so right? you can get all the IP address from here. So you go to this site and then you download the exiting IPs. Okay. The exiting IPs, as I said before, it will change constantly. Okay, so controlling the code, um, it's easy. You, know, you can refresh it every four hours, every two hours. But updating the WAF rule every two hours, it's kind of not recommended, right? Uh, but if you're running a code, you can run it every two hours or maybe every one hour, right? You put them in a local in memory and then you can do it. So you go to the site, you can find it, you know, all the exiting IPs, the IP range of IPv4. Uh, IPv6 and so on. Okay, you take this list and then uh, you load them in the memory, and then you see whether that is coming from or not, and then do it. So I'll run this demo from the local machine, and then we will go to the cloud and explore a little bit more. So I'm going to launch this site right, right now. It's just a, a simple demo site. There's nothing, no code inside. Any question? I'll be waiting for. Right. So, if I go by, where is the site? Oh, it is oh, still running. So that's the uh, normal browser. So I'm going to say I have the endpoint called health, right? Let's look at it. So it says, okay, right? Now I'm going to launch the uh, tar browser. Okay, they said before, you just download the tar, it needs to be good. So once the tar browser launch, it's going to come like this, and then you just connect one. Web um, demo web dot um, day dot dev slash help. We're going. To, that's the site we're going to look at it. If you go here, it tells you right. So it's blocked by um, demo application. So if I take the same URL over here and put them in my um, non thing uh, non tar network browsing. Uh, it tells me, okay, so you are running. It comes back, okay, right? Then uh, similarly, we have we two APIs. So one is the other one is the, uh, the API dot uh, health enter. And because we use the same app, if you use a different app, you can put the different message over here, but it's the same app. So it's the same message, same rules it's going to go through. And I say um, API over here. And then I get that response. So you know how it's blocked. All right. So this block is not happening through the code. So what I was trying to show you, this is the code. If you want to block through the code, you can write a code um, that calls the uh, tar production, right? You know, this is the module. Okay. Um, you have a request delicate as a middleware, and then you inject the middleware on the program. And you know, every time the request comes in, it's going to call is I'm a load IP, and then you you look at it, a load IP code. And all it does is it, it, you know, it calls it, you know, taking it uh, and putting it over here. I use the timer to um, uh, run every four, four hours, but we can use the um, uh, in-memory caching to cache this data, uh, you know, every one hour, two or whatever time interval that you would like to implement your system. 
Well, this is one way of doing it, but this is a programmatic way, which is, you know, in, in a, there is some problem, then you need to deploy the code. If you run in a one computer, one region, it's much easier. But if you run in a hundreds of computers and multiple different regions, this is going to be a pain to roll this fix into everywhere. That's why we have to stick to the WAF. That's where the WAF is kind of outside of your code. You don't do anything. The WAF will take care of everything for you. Okay. All right. Now let's get back to uh, some of the um, uh, things that we are supposed to explore here. So I already explained to you how these torn networks are coming and how we create these IP addresses, right? So this is programmatic way you saw it, but just for learning purpose, but definitely not recommended. But the best recommended way is to use the uh, uh, WAF rules, which you can use the managed rules. Um, managed rules called uh, 300, 600, I believe. Yeah, uh, uh, 300, 600. Bot 300, 600 will do uh, very well on the uh, IPv4, but if you need IPv6, you have to do a... Um, uh, custom um, IPv6, right? So you have to do this. But I have both IPv4 and IPv6 because we, we realized occasionally it's not blocking it, it's going through it because the freshness of that uh, IP, IP feed is not guaranteed. Sometimes they may have some latencies, at least in my case, all I'm talking about my case, it wasn't 100% stopping it. So we have to do this for IPv4 as well. So how we did that, right? Um, it's a very simple. Um, so all we did was, you know, we write a little PowerShell script. Uh, yeah, just go through it, uh, pass in the pass in the uh, parameter that we, you know, you want to run it, and then download the file from the network, and then you split them into two array, IPv4 and IPv6, and then um, you you go through it, um, and uh, policies, and then you pass 600 of junk. Where is the 600 number is coming from? That's the max number of IP address you can assign to a custom rules. That's the max number of text boxes you can assign to the custom rules. Every custom rule can have a 600 the max. So we have to slice into a 600, and then you create. So if it returns like 1,500 IP, it's going to create a three junk, 600, 600, and 300, okay? Um, and then it, it marks that as and uploads it and then it's good to go so at this point but again take a note but custom rule always runs first then only the managed exemption going to go over there okay so if you have anything in a custom rules that's the one first runs for example you something a url you you know uh, that's the one first runs and then it's not going to execute any further rules it's going to go right into the system allow it wait list the uh, request all right now how we can look at the uh, querying the system right so we have these in the two pages, right? So we, here it is the uh, WAF demo web. Um, here is the uh, you know API web, right? So get weather. We have the get weather over here. I have some invalid query string. Let me see if that query string gets me anywhere. It says WAF protected and then it gives me, right? Now I take this number. Okay, it was working before. It was in a detection mode. Now remember, before I demo everything, I changed to the prevention mode. Now it's throwing me this error. Okay. Similarly, I have submitted another request. Let's reload this one, see whether this blocks. Okay, this URI is not blocking, but this URI is blocked. So we're going to copy this value and we go back to um, go back to um, uh, new tab. Switch to the tab. Okay, come back to the FT. Uh, can expand all properties and then go to the logs. So before you turn, uh, you look at the logs. You should all you must turn the diagnostic settings, right? So what I now I did turn on everything. So you go back if you haven't done before, you just click Add Diagnostic, then you turn on whatever you want to see it, right? So I did all audit, all logs, and all metrics, and sending back to that. Um, uh, workspace, so I can query the workspace. So now I go to the logs, which is going to open that workspace, right? Uh, close it, see? and I pick one of the query here, run, and then we have the new value. You can put it over here, right? And then you run it. Okay, so now we have four. You know, it's coming from the uh, front door wrap. It won't from the access log, right? So I'm going to look at what is in the front door app. It tells me the grow SQL injection. So now it says rule name, Microsoft default rule set SQLI 94230 is what failing. Okay, so let me look at the other entry here. 
Um, SQL, okay, MS thread into SQL. So it's now, now two policies fired over, fired over here, right? One is the uh, non MS threat Intel SQLI, other one is the MS threat Intel SQLI. Okay. And then I look at the third one that tells you anomaly score, uh, how this has been blocking evaluation fail, and then it tells me the parameter over here, what parameter, how it's failed, and all those things. You can see the anomaly score right now is a 10. If anything over five is this is going to is going to fail. But in this case, five from the SQLI, five from the uh, uh, MS threat SQLI. Okay. So how we can fix it? We're going to take this policy number, right? What is the rule failing? So the rule failing here is the SQLI 94230, okay? Where it's coming from, query string, right? So we can go back to the policy, and then you go back to the managed rule. So there are two ways you can do it. You can exempt that from the custom rules. You know, you can say, if anything contains so what, what we have over here, right? So what we have over here, if contains the URI contains, you know, query string contains, query URL, you can exempt it. Right? It's never going to say anything at all. That's one way you can solve the problem. So you go here, add custom rule, and then say, you know, ignore, uh, you can name it anything you want, ignore routes um, or known safe routes, right? And then I go and say priority one, I want to execute that as a first. You cannot have the same priority given to two rules. So I'm saying that's the first one. I'm going to say uh, string, and I'm say request to get a knob. I'm going to say query string that contains uh, this value here, query, query URL, right? uh, contains query URL. I convert to whatever term I want, and then I'm going to give a value. So since I convert to two lower case, it doesn't make sense to give everything. So I'm saying two lower, now I say allow traffic, right? That's the one way I can bypass it, but it's going to take like a few seconds. While it's doing, let's look at the other way that we can do it. So now I'm going to open this policy in a new tab. It will take a couple of minutes, right? So now, so that's the one way. I know that, you know, there's a serious things. So I want a quick fix, then I can go on to do that, you know, some parameter, I can exempt it. The other way you can do it, because you know the policy that's failing, the value that's coming in is some of the in, in, you know invalid values, right? So if I take the entire thing and I put on a notepad, you will notice that it contains the uh, pretty bad values. Okay, so I'm going to go back and bring the notepad here. Okay, I ask him that. I got a notepad here. So I paste it over here. So if you see this value, it has a lot of parameters, right? It contains, you know, it, that, that sounds like a SQL string, isn't it? So this is a SQL string, right? So if you take this value, you go back to the T coding, you know, uh, um, URL decoder, this is kind of SQL things. Okay, that's why those MS thread in, Intel SQL I and then the SQL I is, uh, you know, policy is involved. So now if you look at it, this policy is safe. Now if I go and run this one, I might not see this problem. So boom, it's gone through because I exempted it. But if I did not exempt it, I really want to fix this policy, then I go to the managed rules. Right? I don't have any uh, SQLI, so I'm going to go back to here. I'm going to open up the SQLI. Remember, it failed on two rules, right? So it failed on SQLI, okay? The other one is failed is SQLI, what is the rule number? 942-300. The other one is MS Intel SQLI 9931004. So I go back over here, SQLI. And a 942 300. So, this one detect MySQL comment conditions character injection. Okay, so I can only exempt these and I can go back to the query string. And I don't, you know, there may, and that was I copied randomly, right? So, I can say equal any, and now it's going to bypass. So, I can click save and then it's going to create the policy exempted. Okay. And I need to repeat the process for uh, doing the, uh, you know, it's also set MS threat SQL, right? So, that's this one is MS uh, thread Intel SQLI 930 990 So I go back over here, MS thread Intel SQLI. Uh, 
C'est ça. Ah, 1004. 1000, this one. Connect to basic skill authentication, bypass attempt to work. Okay. So I, I need to create both rules. If I'm not sure where this the value is coming from, I don't know where it's coming from the query string, where it's coming from the uh, uh you know, in this case is known to be a query string, so I can say query string and I can do that. But if I don't want to do a particular thing, I want to do XMT everything, then I can say that all rules. So that means you are ignoring this query string for any of these rules. And then click save. Um, it's going to save it again. It's going, you know, you have to repeat that stuff for SQL I as well, then it will start working. Okay. Fine. Now, uh, that is how you query the system. You find out what is going on, you know, and you keep repeating this process until you're done with it. Um, so if I, if you really want to look at this one, um, so the rule, right? So for example, uh, we did a tar rule, right? So we say, uh, no, not that one, the one, so generate one. Uh, we take this rule, uh, rule name, right? So we went to a tar browser, and then we're trying to look at this one. Okay, so this has this number. This is the tar browser, right? So I'm going to snap that number over here. And I run this rule. There's two entries. You don't have to worry about that one. You only have to worry about front door web application launch. So that's what we are. Um, in our um, samples, uh, if we go back to the slide deck, you know, we, we filter it, but I'm not running the entire filter, but you you kind of understand. I see the Microsoft CDN category as this, and then you put the value. You can store the value in a variable and then substitute it, but that's not important in how to run it. So I, I go here, I put that, it says that, right? So this graph is failed. When I expand to that, it can tell me which rule is failed. Oh, this is coming from the IPv6, okay? So if you go tar IPv6 rule is what is what it's what blocking this request. Well, this is the IP address incoming IP address. Now it's not IPv4, it's coming as IPv6. You know, that's what it's telling you. So the client IP address, what, how this rule failed? This this rule failed from the client IP address match value two, three, and here is the details, and you can take it. Now you can go look at it. Um, you know, any failed rule, you will have the details matches, how it's matching, and you can inspect that value, and you can go either fix the code or you XMT. That's up to you. Um, and that's how you 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 address all the, you secure your system, right? Uh, but this all will happen only when you leave policy into a detection, uh, pre uh, prevention mode. If you put them in a detection mode, it will still write all the logs, but it's not going to stop. It's not going to block. It's let you let you go through the traffic. Okay. All right. So what is next? So if you look at it, here is some uh, reference link I provided. Um, again, those reference links are here. Uh, so in this one. Uh, this one, you can understand how, you know, for example, 941 is the number is failing. You can look at it. You can see how everything is um, structured over here. And here that explains, you know, how the front door wrap, you can utilize it. And here is the other article, uh, front door wrap. But, you know, if you're a newbie, you, you want to learn, I would strongly, strongly recommend you go through this link. It takes, just takes a 40 minutes. And if you are if you already know, you you know, when I've done it in like 10, 20 minutes, just fast track, you can, you can understand how to configure and all those things, okay? This will be very helpful if you're new. Uh, I think this is the sample app. It's not published yet, but even it published, I will put a, uh, I will put a URI in the, in the Teams meeting and we will, we can refer to it. Uh, 